first of all, I would also like to join other speakers to thank the Breakthrough Prize Foundation for uh, put together a really exciting symposium and for including me here and uh, for uh, giving me the prize. So, <laughs> so what I want to share with you today are uh, some imaging methods uh, that allow us to, uh, you know, see the molecular world of life, which would be otherwise uh, invisible. And of course, uh, we were given the instruction that we can not only talk about what's existing, but also future. So I will also get to the end uh, towards uh, some future challenges. Uh, focusing on uh, methods developed in my laboratory, but I'll also cover some other lab set methods. So I was a physicist by training, and when I started, I know how little biology that I knew, so I thought I'd start with something really simple. We all know that, uh, hopefully we all know that uh, human or other animals, uh, living systems, plants and so on, are made of uh, cells. And cells are made of many, many, many different kinds of molecules. And then I also give you the size scale. The cells are about uh, one uh, to about 100 microns, about the width of your hair, and uh, molecules are one to 10 nanometer in size. And then so these molecules, as I said, so many different kinds are really interacting in intricate way, forming intricate networks together give the cells life. And we really want to use imaging or direct visualization approaches to visualize these interactions and to understand how do they collectively give uh, the cells life. And then if you think about it, then you would like your imaging approaches to have these properties. Um, uh, you would like to have them to have molecular scale resolution. There are so many different kinds. You would like to have the molecular specificity. And finally, because we are dealing with living system, things are changing and moving all the time, so we would like to have the dynamic imaging capability. And uh, one of the imaging modalities do these, uh, pretty well, uh, does this pretty well, and that's light microscopy. Uh, especially on these two fronts, the molecular specificity, because uh, we have Light has so many different colors. We have so many different color probes. We can link them to the molecule of interest with high specificity. And we know light microscopy can be compatible with uh, living system imaging. Traditionally, light microscopy has not been done very well uh, or doing very well, uh, was not doing very well with the molecular scale resolution. Uh, that was because of a very well-known physical property or phenomenon called the diffraction limit of light microscopy. In the very simple terms, uh, that means because light is a wave, it diffracts. So when you try to focus a light beam, the light beam has a finite size of about uh, half of the wavelength, 200 nanometer. So it's very hard to resolve or see things smaller than that. And that was known very early on. In 1873, when Ernst Abbe first identified this limit. And I just mentioned that molecules are almost two orders of magnitude smaller, so if we want to so see these molecular interactions, we really need to overcome this diffraction limit. Now I want to say that uh, this, uh, collectively these methods are called super resolution imaging methods. There are different methods out there that can overcome the diffraction limit. So I would like to start with our own, which got uh, me the prize and that is called stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy. So let me give you a little bit more of uh, what the resolution limit means fundamentally. Because of the limit, no matter how small an object is when you're imaging it, its image has a finite size. When you have two objects that are close, then their finite size images overlap. That overlapping makes it hard to resolve them. That's the fundamental cause of the diffraction limited resolution. So in STORM, how do we overcome that? We think outside the three-dimensional world. We add one more dimension, that's the time dimension. So we do not turn on all the molecules simultaneously so that otherwise the spatially overlapping image will not overlap in time. And then we got to that because prior to that we are uh, discovered photoswitchable dyes that would allow us to do that. So then you can see we activate a subset at a time, we pinpoint their center position uh, with nanometer precision, 
And then we put these uh, positions together into a high resolution image. And then if I put them together in contrast, this is a cellular structure called microtubule. And then in the same field of view, you can see the diffraction emitted image. You can appreciate the resolution gain. And over the years, we've improved the resolution. And now it's already uh, as high as a few nanometers in some systems, which uh, uh, is close to two orders of magnitude better than the original diffraction limit. And it really had allowed us to make uh, interesting biological discoveries of a variety of different cellular structures. And I want to just single out one of them to show you uh, for two reasons. One is, uh, you know, in the early days when I show the storm method, people always say, wow, it gives you pretty images. Do you learn something that is really new, not just improving or incrementally improving some existing knowledge? And the structure that I'm showing here demonstrate that you can use super resolution storm imaging to discover cellular structures uh, that people didn't know existed before. And the other is a personal reason, because the first author here, Ke Xu, is actually, uh, he was a former postdoc in my lab, and then he's now an assistant professor at Berkeley. So, so this is a periodic uh, skeletal structure that we observed uh, in neurons formed by these periodic acting rings uh, connected by another kind of a protein called spectrin. And uh, after that, over the years, we've actually identified many different molecules on this structure and begin to understand a variety of its functions. But I want to show you why the structure was missed before. And that's because, uh, oh, you, th this is a three-dimensional image. So you turn around, these stripes show you the rings that are periodically spaced, as I said, by these pink molecules spectrum. So why are they not seen before? This is why. If you just do the diffraction limited imaging, the distance or the spacing between the rings is below the diffraction limit. So you completely miss that. All right, so uh, as I said, uh, you know, there are multiple different kinds of uh, super resolution imaging approaches and I certainly do not have time to cover all of them in this short symposium. So for those of you who are interested, we have a, uh, a recent review article that is uh, just published in Science uh, a, a month or two ago, where we not only covered a variety of different uh, super resolution imaging methods, including our own methods, uh, methods developed by other laboratories, but focused on biological knowledge that are gained by this. And there really is, it's really a blooming field. And I would like to highlight some of them. You know, uh, in addition to this, uh, uh, what we call spatially stochastic approaches to separate molecules. There are also spatially coordinated approaches uh, to separate molecules and resolving them, uh, such as the pioneering method uh, uh, STED, uh, pioneered by Stefan Hell at Max Planck Institute, a method similar to our stone method to PALM, uh, developed by Eric Betzik, I think who also moved from Julinia Farm <laughs> to, to, to Berkeley. And uh, also, you could even use non-optical approaches. For example, you expand the sample, and then you use conventional diffraction-limited imaging, you can effectively get high resolution. That's called expansion microscopy, developed uh, by Ed Boyden's lab. And uh, here I want to show you some of these other approaches. So this is the stat work uh, from uh, Stefan Hell's lab showing you that you can actually look into the living mice brain to see dendritic spine. And then here is a uh, lattice lychee sim method that is uh, very good at get high time resolution and low damage for uh, imaging. And uh, the movie mo runs really fast <laughs> on my computer to demonstrate it's fast imaging, but this loading didn't show how fast it, I mean, it, it's supposed to be faster, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and then finally uh, this, uh, yeah, this new mean flux method developed by Stefan Hell's lab to get to actually single digit nanometer, one to two nanometer resolution so that you can really uh, see uh, molecular interactions at very fine scale. 
So uh, the future challenge in my mind, you know, I really would like to have not necessarily just using optical imaging approaches, combine a variety of different imaging approaches that could be light microscopy, including super resolution imaging, electron microscopy, uh, soft x-ray imaging, and so on, to get what, we, what I would call a full molecular architecture of the cell where we see every single molecule, where they are, and how do they interact with each other in a dynamic way. And of course, with that, you would like to have, you know, satis you would like to satisfy a variety of uh, requirement. And a couple of obvious ones are, you know, you, you have to have molecular or submolecular uh, scale resolution, and you would like to have a reasonably high time resolution and long imaging time so that you could capture the entire uh, molecular processes in real time. But there is a uh, new challenge when you want to get this kind of a full molecular uh, architecture. Remember, as I said, inside the cell, there's not just one or two or three kinds of molecules. There are actually thousands, if not tens of thousands of different genes and even, in, I mean, even small molecules and so on. So if you want to get this kind of a full molecular architecture, you would like to have this uh, genomic scale uh, throughput to vi visualize the collective action of all molecules. And we have uh, making progress towards that direction, so I want to give you one recent method that we uh, developed called MRFISH, Multiplexed Error Robust Fish, and I won't give you too detailed experimental implementation, but I want to give you the concept of why we can actually image so many different kinds of molecules and distinguish them. Because if you just think about typical imaging approaches, if you want to image three different kinds of molecules, you use three color imaging. If you want to image 10,000 different kinds of molecules, uh, it's not possible to distinguish uh, 10,000 colors because uh, the fluorophores uh, spectrum has a finite width. So how do we deal with that? So, you know, we came up with this pretty simple concept uh, which combine error robust barcoding combinatorial labeling, and sequential imaging. Uh, sounds like a mouthful. Let me just uh, simplify that. So for each, this one we apply to RNA first. So for each RNA, we give it a binary barcode, 101010, one, one, and so on. And then we label it so that we can imprint this barcode onto this RNA. Forgive me that without the proper time, I mean, it's sufficient time, I, I won't be able to get into that encoding process. But what happened after the encoding process is we read out them sequentially. In the first round, we read only those RNAs. Their first bit reads one, but not zero. And in the second round, we read out those RNAs or detect those RNAs. Their second bit reads one, but not zero, and so on and so forth. After n rounds of imaging, you can ask this very simple question, and that is how many different kinds of RNA species you can distinguish. And you are all super clever, so you probably can come up with the answer right away. That's two to the nth, right? So if you just do simple 16 rounds of imaging, you can distinguish 65,000 different kinds of RNAs, which is the whole transcriptome scale. Um, as, we, uh, as I presented this uh, idea to my lab, we all get very excited, but then soon we found the picture was just a little too good to be true because uh, the error also propagates. Each bit of error can be small, 16-bit add together can be substantial. That's why we did the error or bust of barcoding. So with that, we have already demonstrated the ability to image some th a thousand R different RNA species inside cell. And uh, we also applied it to DNA to actually can see the three-dimensional organization of DNA, which is critical for gene expression regulation. And then here is another thing that I want to talk about what I consider to be a major future challenge is we would like to have whole genome DNA imaging, whole genome RNA imaging, and also even though RNA gives you the expression profile, which I will show later to be very important, a lot of the functional molecules inside the cell are proteins, and we would like to get whole genome protein imaging. That is harder to do, okay? But there are labs, uh, in the world, around the world that are trying that, and we're interested in trying that too. So uh, these are for the molecular architectures inside the cell. But as we invent this approach, actually one of the 
major application that we invent, at a, actually as a goal that I had for this Murfish method, is to go back a little bit in thinking about this diagram and in think that inside our body, there are so many, many, many different kinds of cells too. You, you know, a actually human body have some kind of a 30 to 40 trillion cells and they are really many different kinds. And the problem is we don't even know how many different types of cells we have. And not only that, they form intricate spatial organization. And the spatial organization is critical for the tissue function and eventually for organ function and then for, for you know, uh, living, living beings and so on. So when we are able to do what we consider tr gene expression profiling of individual cells, or measuring quantitatively the expression levels of thousands of RNAs simultaneously in a cell that actually offer us a quantitative and systematic way to identify what type of cells we have. Because ultimately, why are they different? Not because they have different genome, they largely share a similar genome, but because different genes are expressed to different levels inside the cell. Okay, so, and then by doing an imaging approach, we not only can identify these different type of cells, we can directly see where they are, because it's an in-tissue imaging approach. So I'm just gonna quickly go through a couple of slides. You know, this is uh, our recent work of a, uh, in co collaboration with Catherine Dulac, my uh, uh, colleague at the uh, Harvard uh, Department of Molecular Cell Biology and uh, her lab, and uh, so this is a really fun collaboration, and this is a Murfish image of a small region of the brain, and then we can see many, many different kinds of RNA molecules, what they are, where they are inside the cell, and identify the cell type. And since there are too many kinds imaged, you might not even know what to see here. So I actually can pare it down a little bit, showing you just eight of the major cell markers. And then you can immediately see, oh, these are inhibitory cell markers, so they're inhibitory neurons. These blue ones are excitatory cell markers. They are excitatory neurons, and so on and so forth. And we imaged a much larger region than this, a block of region, which is important for, uh, called the preoptic region of the uh, mouse hypothalamus, which is important for social behavior, for uh, essential functions such as eating, drinking, and so on and so forth. And then uh, we actually not only identify these major cell mark, uh, classes, uh, but also 70 different types of neurons just in this one region of the brain. It tells you how complicated it is. I'm gonna skip this part except to say that not only we can see where they are, we can see which neuron perform which function. And then eventually this is the kind of a map what we call a molecular and spatial and functional cell atlas of this particular brain region, the hypothalamic uh, preoptic region. And in this region, here are different kinds of cells in different colors. And then if I just slightly move a little bit, and you can see how the spatial organization changed dramatically. And then, uh, as I said, in this, uh, we not only know what are these cells, their molecular property, but importantly, the function they play, whether they're important in parenting or whether they're important in fighting and so on. And if I just blow up, you can really appreciate the beauty of this kind of uh, cell atlas. And then uh, I want to say that uh, there are also other labs who develop other kinds of approaches, uh, for example, in-situ sequencing approaches uh, by uh, Mass Nielsen Lab, uh, George Church Lab, and the uh, Carl uh, Dysroth lab. And then here I show you a beautiful work of Carl Dysroth's lab's so star map approach that gives you a beautiful map of a brain cortical region, different cell types, and so on. And then uh, ultimately, the, the, the ch challenge is uh, really we want to get the entire hum human cell atlas. What are the different types of cells that are present? How are they organized spatially? What are their functions? How do they communicate with each other? And how do they go wrong in diseases? And it's just like, uh, you know, if we zoom out, you see the human being like a globe like this. But if we zoom in, we want to see a Google Earth map for cells in our human body. 
And uh, I should say that this is a really a global initiative uh, that is uh, being planned, and then it will be a collaborative effort of many, many labs around the world using a variety of different approaches, not just imaging approaches, but also other approaches such as sequencing-based approaches and so on. Okay, so with that, I also would like to, you know, since we're professors, uh, you know, we uh, know a lot of the actual work, they're really done by the heroic students and postdocs. Uh, you know, they're day to day, you know, being not only very creative, but also being persistent and not afraid of momentary setbacks and just uh, working hard to make things happen. So I would like to thank generations of uh, students in my lab, but we also enjoyed uh, collaborations with many labs. As for example, this uh, brain mapping is a very nice stimulating collaboration with uh, Catherine Dulac's lab and many other labs. Uh, and thank you all for, for your attention. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, my question is about the super resolution imaging and its limits. So are there any fundamental limits to what super resolution imaging can do? And if not, what are the trade-offs and limiting factors for currently available techniques? Yeah, so uh, we like to call these uh, diffraction unlimited methods. So, so there is not really physical principle to actually limit you to a particular resolution anymore. But there are very important practical limitations. One thing is all these super resolution imaging approaches, these fluorescence imaging approaches, they rely on tags. These are fluorophores that are tagged to the endogenous molecule of interest. So the endogenous uh, molecules in our body do not give enough light for us to see that. And these fluorescent tag molecules, even the small organic molecules uh, like fluorescent dyes, they have about one nanometer kind of a size. So at the moment, they do impose that practical limit. But, you know, you could imagine developing different kind of uh, light emitting probes so with new chemistry that get to much smaller that can still be attached to uh, biological molecules of interest with specificity and so on. So there you go, you just added another future challenge. Okay, so uh, first of all, let me thank you so much for asking this question. I didn't even explain this uh, structure. These structures are not on microtubules. These are uh, what we call periodic, a membrane associate periodic skeleton. They're right underneath the membrane of uh, exon is where we first detected that, and then later on we and others have seen it in dendrites too. So they're directly associated with the membrane. Uh, so that, I just use this as an opportunity to clarify where the structure is. And an important function is to actually anchor functional membrane proteins. Why are they not detected by electron microscopy is your question. It's a super good question because uh, it should have been. And uh, uh, I think one of the reason is, uh, you know, electron microscopy has that resolution. Now, if you want to do cryo-EM, the contrast is very difficult yet for the membrane, because it's directly associated with membrane, actually the contrast is pretty difficult for seeing this. But you could do immunolabeling, like immunogoat labeling. Now, the problem it was not seen before, you know, scientific discovery always have some serendipity in it, is uh, this kind of structure, people didn't know it existed before. But the ring is made of acting. Actin exists in a different kinds of form, previously well known inside the cell, these actin filament. They're highly dynamic, they form and dissemble very rapidly. So in order to actually capture that by electron microscopy, you need to fix them so rapidly to beat that dynamics. So you want the fixative to go into the cell super rapidly. And what people have previously been doing is they add detergent to live neurons and try, or other cell types to try to get rid of the membrane so that the fixative can get into it. 
This is a membrane associated structure. So if you add det detergent to live cells, the membranes are gone, the structure is gone. So luckily they didn't see it. So left for us to discover. Thank you.